In this video, I'm going to be explaining the use of EPANET. EPANET is a free software, can be downloaded uh, from the internet, that we can use to simulate uh, water distribution systems. And as this lab handout indicates, uh, in the consulting world, in the professional world, people usually do not use EPANET for uh, design. Um, it is free. Its user interface is very simple and straightforward. Um, it's limited into what it can do. Uh, usually in the consulting world, people are going to be using software packages that cost upwards of a thousand or mul multiple thousands of dollars. That behind the scenes, the calculations they're running are the same ones that EPANET is using, but they uh, include better user interfaces that allow for um, usually more powerful simulations or more efficient simulations. For the purposes of learning how to use software like this, EPANET is great. It's also great for simulating simple systems such as those that might be built in like the developing world or very rural contexts. Um, I have actually used it in consulting as well for a, um, a project that was a recycled water expansion project. So it is commonly used. Uh, many engineers know about it and know how to use it. And today we're going to learn the basics of how to use it. So uh, we are going to be looking at this uh, figure, which is the example town. And as I first, I'm going to go through just the basics of EPANET, where the different things are, how to navigate around in it, and then I'm going to be building this uh, system. So if you're following along on the video and you want to be building a system, you'll have to have this printed out or on a separate screen or something handy so that you can be building it along with me because I'm going to be referring to it, but I'm not going to have it on the screen as I'm building it. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, EPANET. This is the user interface. It starts out very uh, clean. Uh, you'll see kind of the basics up here. Uh, mostly what we're going to be using is these tools in the toolbar up here. So I will just walk through each of the six main tools here and then kind of orient you to a couple other things that you've been using. So first of all, we can look down the lower left. Uh, we see that it says auto length off down here. This is GPM. So the unit system we're using right now is in gallons per minute. Uh, and then it's got a coordinate system going on right here. If I wanted to change the unit system, one thing I can do, I can look up here and see there's this browser. The browser is very useful. Uh, one of the tabs is the map we'll be talking about later. The other is data. In the data drop down, you can see junctions, reservoirs, tanks, pipes, pumps, valves, labels, patterns, curves, controls, and options. If I go down to options, um, this is where I can set kind of the ba the global settings for this uh, file. Uh, so if I look, if I double click on hydraulics, here's where I could change my flow units if I wanted to. So from gallons per minute, it could change to million gallons per day. I could change to cubic feet per second. Um, down here, you get into the metric stuff: liters per second, um, cubic meters per hour, etc. I stick with gallons per minute. The head loss formula that the program is going to use to calculate head loss is set for Hayes and Williams. They use a drop down. I could change it to Darcy Weisbach. I could also change it to Chesy Manning. This is similar to what we use in Manning's equation for open channel flow, but we're going to stick with Hayes and Williams. And then it has a few other categories in here that I could look at if I wanted to. We won't be doing much with quality um, or reactions. Uh, you might at some point um, in your future use uh, the time setting if you're doing like a simulation throughout the course of the day and you want to simulate the different hours in the day. Um, for example, we've talked about diurnal cur demand curves. You can simulate these in EPANET. Here's where you would set those kinds of things. And then we're not going to do much with energy either, but this is if you, for pumps, um, if you wanted to calculate costs and so forth, you can do that through this. All right, so here's our canvas. Uh, I'm gonna start by looking at these guys up here. So the first one is add junction. If I click on that, I can go around and 
add junctions. Junctions are points where now that I've added it, I can double click on one and it'll bring up the properties of that point. Another way I could do it is just by right clicking and um, uh, on that point and hitting properties. So it's got a junction ID. You'll see uh, as I go down, these are all the properties associated with that point. Um, the yellow are things that would happen when I simulate the model, the results of that uh, point. But this junction, what I want to highlight is properties that have an asterisk next to them are ones that are required to be input for the model to run. So in the case of the junction, it's just the ID, which is automatically generated when you build it, and the elevation, which is set for zero. Uh, the base demand is going to be important too. This is the demand we're assuming is happening from this node. Within a system we're simulating, it's the water that's being withdrawn from the system at that node for use. Um, and the demand stuff, we're not going to worry about the demand pattern categories today. If I click on this other point, all of this updates for that junction. It's junction 2. So I can add junctions. The next one is reservoir. If I click on that and click a reservoir, now I have a reservoir. And if I look at its properties, you'll see that the only requirement really here is the total head, which is set to 0. Now a reservoir is what's called a fixed grade node or a fixed head node. Um, it's a junction like the other junctions, but the head at that junction is always constant to what I set it at. So we're assuming it's infinitely large reservoir of water where that wa uh, water surface, which defines the head, is not changing over time. This is different than a tank, which is the next one. A tank, you'll see the properties have updated already for that. We're going to be using these two. They have um, more required inputs. The elevation. The elevation of a tank is the elevation of the ground level where the tank is. The initial level. The in, when it says level, <clears throat> it's not talking about elevation. Elevation is, you know, um, vertical distance relative to a datum like mean sea level. Level in EPANET is the height above the ground level or the height above the elevation. So if the elevation is set to say 20, <clears throat> and so we say the ground level is at 20 feet there, if I said the initial level is 10, that's saying the initial level of water in the tank is 10 feet above the ground level. In other words, it's at 30 feet of elevation. Okay. The minimum level in the tank is how low can the level drop in the tank before it's empty. In this case, I wouldn't want to set it at zero. If this was an elevated tank, uh, let's say it, um, the tank bottom was at 10 feet and the top was at 20 feet, I could set the initial level to 10, which means this tank is empty. Um, the level of water is at 10 and the minimum level is at 10, so it's empty. It could fill up to the maximum level, which is 20. That maximum level at 20 is 20 feet above the elevation of 20 or at an elevation of 40. Okay, so you've got to keep all of that straight. The diameter is the diameter of that tank. Uh, it assumes that the tank is a cylinder. And so when I set the diameter, the minimum level and the maximum level, I'm setting the, entire, the total volume of that tank. I'm also setting, as water is withdrawn or put into that tank, um, the diameter is going to affect like how quickly is the level changing. If I had a really small diameter and I put in a lot of water in the tank, the level's going to go up really fast. But a really big diameter, I can put a lot of water in, and it's only going to go up slowly. And because those levels are going to affect the head in our systems, that's important. If you had a square tank or something, you would be setting the diameter as like an equivalent cylindrical diameter. There's also volume curves you can get into as well, but we're not going to worry about that. All right, the next one is add a pipe. Now, these first three that we've done, the junction, the tank, and the reservoir, we just plop down. 
but the next three have to be drawn between our other our, our ones that we've plopped down. So the pipe has to be drawn between, for example, a reservoir and a junction. You can see the pipe has started there. It has a start node, which is three, that's this reservoir, and an end node, which is one, that's my junction here. Also required is the length, which defaults to a thousand. In it, although it doesn't say the units on here, these units are all specific to whatever unit system I'm in. In the GPM unit system, length is in feet, diameter is in inches. And then roughness has to do with which, what uh, equation am I using to calculate my head loss. Because I've selected Hazen Williams, the roughness is the C value for Hazen Williams. If I selected Darcy Weisbach, the roughness would be the friction factor, okay? So those are the only required things for pipes. I can change these here. So if I wanted a 500 foot long pipe, I would change it there. If I wanted a 14 inch diameter pipe, I would change it there. If I want 120 for my C value, I'd change it there. All right, so that's pipes. I've also got pumps. Pumps also need to connect two nodes, so I could pump from this reservoir into this node. Now pumps, it's important what the start node and the end node are. So you can see I drew it from the tank to this node and therefore the pump is drawn pumping in that direction that I drew it from the start node to the end node. Um, beyond that, there is nothing in here that's required for the pump but um, I, I've never really tried this, but I would assume you actually do need a pump curve in there. I don't know what would happen if you tried to, to simulate it without one, but we'll talk about adding a pump curve in a minute. Uh, so one thing, though, is that this pump direction is important. It's pumping from the reservoir to this node. If I wanted it to pump the other direction, I would have to either draw it from the node to here, switch which is the start node and the end node in here or I can right click on it and hit reverse and it will reverse the direction it, it will reverse the start node and the end node for me okay <clears throat> all right we'll get to pump curves later in the example I can also add valves so a valve <laughs> oops by the way, if you click and you aren't, it does this, that means you didn't quite click exactly on the tank itself, so it missed it. I can right click to cancel, or I can just try again. If I click here, I can actually add a vertex. It doesn't do anything to the actual calculation. It just shows a vertex there. Um, so that can be useful sometimes if like I'm trying to draw two pipes in parallel between the same nodes, but I want to be able to see both of them. So, for example, if I wanted to draw another pipe in parallel here, but I didn't want it to overlap that because then I wouldn't be able to see it, I could do something like this. And now I can see both. It doesn't, you know, the fact that it shows it this way doesn't matter. The, the lengths are just what they are. So um, later when we do um, our project in this class, we'll be using the auto length feature where it will automatically set the length based on how long the line is. And then it will matter. Uh, but we can manually change the, that after we've drawn it too. So back to valves. When I click on the valve, um, it requires a diameter, a type, and a setting. In the type, there are six types. They are pressure reducing valves, uh, pressure sustaining valves, uh, pressure brake valves, uh, flow control valves, and then um, these two, I'm not exactly sure what they are. Maybe throttle control valve and um, I don't know what that one is either. But the ones I've mainly used are pressure reducing valve, would keep the pressure from going above a certain amount. Pressure sustaining valve, which would keep the pressure at least at a certain amount, but usually at the cost of flow. Or um, a flow control valve, which I could then set for what flow I want to maximize going through there. Um, 
whichever one I choose, that's going to define what the setting means. If I say pressure reducing valve and I set the setting at 40, in this unit system, that means my this pressure reducing valve is going to keep the pressure from going above 40 psi at that through that valve. If I set it for a flow control valve, now that means I've set this to uh, limit the flow through that valve to 40 gallons per minute. Okay. So those are the six main things, junctions, reservoir, tanks, pipes, pumps, and valves. And with those, we can build our systems. Um, it, as we do the example, I'll be showing more functionality. Uh, but for now, that's just the broad brush overview. Okay. So I'm going to start a new project. And again, we are going to be building this. I'm going to bring it off the screen. But um, what this is, is we've got a reservoir over here. Um, we've got a pump right here. We've got a tank up here. And then these, uh, all of these squares represent nodes or junctions that we need to build. There's also, uh, we won't need a junction here because this junction kind of is this tank. We won't need, uh, we, let's see, we will need these two junctions because the pump is going to connect between those. This is not a junction, it's the actual reservoir itself. And then you can see the dimensions, which are going to be the lengths of these different pipes as we build them. Up in the upper left, you can see some important information. The dotted, the dashed pipes are 6 inch, the solid are 12 inch. We're using a Hazen Williams C value of 130 for all of them. And then the water distribution system demands all junctions have four and a half gallons per minute. And then the fire flow node 12, which is down this up lower right corner, is going to have 2,500 gallons per minute when we simulate that. All of the water distribution system elevations are 25 feet. The water distribution system is this grid. Um, the tank doesn't have a demand. The pump and the reservoir don't, they don't have a demand. It's the city. It's the grid that has the demands. And then the pump, we're going to have a pump curve and this standard point, standard design point is going to help us build that pump curve. So we'll get to that. All right. So get this off the screen. Now, um, let's start building this. We're going to start by changing one of our defaults. So we're going to go up to, um, I think it's view and then options. No. Project. Yes. Under project, under defaults, um, we can change what the, what EpaNet will default properties to when we build things. Um, so if you see in the properties, uh, the node elevation defaults zero, the pipe length defaults a thousand. One of the things we want to do is because all of our pipes roughness is 130, we're going to change our pipe roughness default to 130. So we don't have to change that later. We could also change our node elevation to 25, but I'm not going to do that right now. Um, I'm not going to do it for the pipe length either. I'm just going to leave the rest of these as is. And I just want to show you that. Okay. So let's take our junctions. And, uh, well, first we'll, we'll do our reservoir. That we're going to put over here on the left side of the model. And we're going to take our tank and we're going to put that kind of up here. Now we need our junctions, so we're going to need one on either side of the pump. And now we got to build our grid. So we go over here and we're going to put in three nodes like that. And then the next step has one, two, three, four. And then over here we've got one, two, three. And then we've got one, two, three, four. So this is our system. Now we can go and start putting in pipes. So we're going to connect from the reservoir to that first node. We're not going to connect between these two yet because we're going to put a pump there. 
we're going to put in a pipe from here to here. And basically, we just need to now connect all of these. So go ahead and do that. Some people get really um, frustrated with the fact that these are not perfectly orthogonal, uh, that they're just kind of ran look kind of random. And that's just um, something you have to deal with with Ethernet is it doesn't look that great. <laughs> Uh, you can put in backdrops, like we could use this actual figure as a backdrop and kind of trace over it if we wanted to, and that helps our lines look better. Uh, but at least for today, we're not going to worry about it. We're just going to have to accept that some things in life are not as pretty as we want them to be. We need one connecting here to there. Okay, I think we're good. We're gonna need to draw our pump now. So we grab our pump. We're pumping from the reservoir into our system. So if we start on the left and we draw it to the right node. All right, now I want to change a lot of my properties on here. So I can click on my reservoir, check its head is at zero. And that is actually what I want. My, my diagram says the water surface elevation is zero feet. So I'm going to leave that as is. Now, this over here, all of these nodes are at uh, 25 feet elevation, and they all have a demand of 4.5 GPM. So we're going to learn how to do a group edit here. We can go up to edit, and there's a group edit. It's grayed out, but we could select our region. Um, so if I do select region, what this allows me to do is to trace a region around which I want to edit the points. And if I double click, oh no, wait, right click, it closes the polygon. So now everything within this polygon, when I go up to edit and group edit, is eligible for editing. So it says for all, and I can choose either junctions or pipes within the outlined area. I want to do what? Well, I want all of those junctions, I want to replace whatever their elevation is with 25. And hit OK. 14 junctions were updated. Perfect. Now I'm going to go back up to the group edit, and I'm going to do the same thing. For junctions, I'm going to replace the base demand with 4.5 GPN. OK. 14 were updated. Perfect. All right, so now if I click on those, I should see the elevation is 25 and the base demand is 4.5. These nodes, uh, I'm not going to worry about. We'll leave those at zero. They're not part of the distribution system. Okay, um, let's do our pipes. So here, we need to look at the dimensions of each of these pipes. Uh, the first one here, the length is 50 feet. And then I skip the pump. The length of the second pipe is 5,000 feet. Now all of these little vertical ones are 400. So I can go through and enter all of those. This one to the tank is 700. And then the horizontal ones, this pipe is 1,000. So is this one and this one, 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 and this one. But this one on the bottom, we have to note, is actually 2,000. Also, this main line from the reservoir straight across and then up to the tank is a 12-inch pipe, but all of these around here are 6-inch, so i got to change these diameters to 6. Oops. 
Oops, did I screw that up? Yeah. This one is still 12. So it's that one. Okay. Uh, that's 12. That's 12. Okay. Now we're back down here at 6. 6. So it's kind of annoying right now because I have to click on each one to see what it is, but we'll show you now a really important thing, which is how to visualize different things on our diagram here. Um, and for that, we're going to use our browser and our map. So on the map, we can change how we view nodes and links. So what I'm going to do is for nodes, I'm going to say, uh, sorry, for links, I want to say, I want to view the length. When I do that, it comes up with this little legend, and it's going to color code these links based on this legend. So a couple things. One is, what if I want to see the actual link? Well, I can change the labeling. I can go up to my view options, and now when I go down to notation, I can say I want to display node values and link values. I'm also going to right now while I'm here, I'm going to turn on flow arrows. We'll use these later. I like the fancy ones. There we go. Okay. Now it's actually showing us the label for what the length of these links is. I don't like the yellow. It's hard to see. So I can change these colors by just uh, right clicking on the legend. It brings up the legend editor where I can change these colors and the bounds. So I could say I want, I like, I like the color, the, the, the intervals it's given me, but I don't like yellow. So I'm going to click on yellow. I'm going to change it to kind of an orange and hit OK and hit OK. And now it's updated it. So now I can see, did I do this right? These are all 1,000, this is 2,000, these are all 400. That's good, 700, I think my lengths are good. I can now change my this to diameter. Oops, and I can see I forgot to change these three to six inch. And this one. Okay, now what I have here showing for the diameters matches what's on the diagram. I could do the same with the nodes. I could change this to base demand and check, okay, these all have 4.5 GPM. I can then check that the elevations are good. It shows me 25 for those elevations. I have not yet set anything for my tank, so let's do that now. The tank, um, it says the diameter is 44 feet. The start, it says the start elevation is 150 feet. Um, we're going to assume that the elevation here is like the other nodes in the distribution system and it's 25 feet. And if the starting elevation is 150 feet, then the starting level is 125. We're going to set the minimum level at, well, we'll change that in a second, but the maximum level, oopsies, like that, is uh, since the depth of the tank is 36 feet, it's 36 more than 125, which is 161. We're going to set our minimum level equal to 161. Ah, sorry. Oops, I screwed that up. Okay, okay. Back back the train up here. I I was jumping ahead a little too fast. I do want my elevation to be 25. I do want my initial level to be 125. I'm going to say that that's also my max level. And my min level, I'm going to go 36 feet less than that. So um, I take off, I go to 89. So this tank goes from 89 to 125, and I'm starting it full. Okay, 
That's what I'm going to do. Let's see. So now the last thing we need to do is we need to do something with the pump. Um, so for that, we need to go up to our data tab here. And we're going to pick the curves option. And then we're going to hit an add. Now here's the curve editor. This is where I can build a pump curve. I'm going to call this pump curve. Whatever you call it here, you're going to have to type in that exactly in the properties for the pump. Here is where you can put the flow and head uh, combination points to build the pump curve. So it says here, my pump standard design point has a head 150 at feet and Q is 63 GPM. So for Q, I'm going to put in 63 and for head, I'm going to put in 150. And when I click after that, it builds a pump curve just based on one point. How did it build a parabolic curve out of one point? Well, it made some assumptions. I'm saying I want this point to be on the curve. So I go up to 63 and I go up to 150 and that point is on the curve. But it needs at least three points to build a quadratic. So you can see here, the equation is here, it's quadratics, it's 200 minus 0 0.0126 uh, squared. So what it did is it needed, it built a point on this axis right here, that's called the shutoff head, that's at zero flow and 200 head. To do that, it just takes whatever I put in for my single point here, multiplies it by 1.33 and calls that the shutoff head. So since I put in 150, it called the shutoff at 200. Then it put a point over here, um, sort of intersecting this curve. So that here it's zero head and it has flow. What is that uh, flow? Well, to do that, it takes whatever number is here and doubles it. So for 63, I get 126. That's where this is going to intersect that curve. Now it's got three points, the one I gave it, and two that it made up uh, in order to build this curve. If I kept adding points in here, it would uh, continually adjust this curve to adapt to what I'm putting in there. I could put in 10 points to try to simulate exactly the pump curve I see from the catalog. But for us, we're just going to put in one point and leave it at this curve that it's giving us. Okay? So the curve ID is pump curve. I say OK. Now I go to my pump, double click on that, and then the pump curve, I type in pump curve. Now I'm ready to actually run my model. Everything's all set. And so to run the model, I'm going to hit this little lightning bolt up here. Hit run. It says run was successful. Hit OK. Now I want to see the results. So I'm going to go back up to my map and I would like to see what uh, are my pressures and what are my flow rates. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so I can see this a little bit better. So I'm going to go up to nodes and I want pressure and I'm going to go to links and I'm going to hit flow. All right. So in GPM, I can see there's 62.95 GPM coming from the uh, from the reservoir coming into my system, and now you can see the flows kind of distributing through the system. The pressures are all kind of in the 54-ish psi range. Um, most of that is going to be, you know, set by the tank. Um, there's not that much water coming from the tank right now. Um, and so there's there's my simulation. Now I know what's going on in my system. It's done it for me. Um, I can view other things too, like the head um, on the nodes. In the links, I can look at velocity or uh, unit head loss. But most of the time, we're looking at flow and pressure, making sure our system's working well. All right. So now I want to simulate a fire. So 
All I'm going to do for that is I'm going to go down to this lower right node and I'm going to change its base demand from 4.5 GPM to 2500 GPM. We know the fire flows are much higher than normal demands. So what if I change that? I just do that and I go up and I hit my lightning bolt and it says warning messages were generated. See status report for details. All right. This can help me if I can learn to uh, translate it. It says warning negative pressures. So close that. Well, I'm looking at my pressures and my flows right now. And sure enough, where my pressure, where my fire was, I'm down at negative 8.11 psi. So pressures at these adjacent nodes, 26 psi, 34 psi, is kind of okay-ish. But, and now I can see I'm drawing a lot of water from the tank. I'm drawing just a little bit more from the pump. Um, but a lot of this water, the 2500 GPM, has to come through these two pipes to get to my fire. And I'm getting too much head loss between these adjacent junctions and the fire and, and also had loss on the way to those adjacent junctions. So this would tell me my system's not designed for my fire. I need to do something. So as an engineer, one thing I might do is I say, well, let's make this pipe bigger. What if we made this a 10 inch pipe? We do that. We hit run. Hey, it's successful. Just by making that 10 inch pipe, I now see I'm getting a lot more flow through this pipe now than this one and the, the pressure is 17.22 psi. Uh, typically we like to see pressures during a fire of at least 20 psi, so I might wind up doing something else too, like maybe I make this one 10 and this one 10. Now I run it and I feel good about it. Okay. Now in reality there's a couple more considerations we need to layer on. One is that the, prep, the fire could be anywhere in our system, not just down here. Although, just looking at the system by inspection, probably these two points are the most vulnerable to fire because they're the farthest from the tank and the pump where the water's coming from. So as head losses accumulate, they're probably going to be kind of the worst case. If the elevations varied in the system, I'd also be looking at that, like where are the highest points because those ones are going to have lower pressures than lower points. The sun just came out from the clouds and is kind of blinding me here. So sorry if my face looks angelic right now. Um, the other consideration is what if one of these pipes was out for service? Uh, so let's say this pipe had a break in it. Um, how do we simulate that? Well, the way we're going to do it is we look at the properties for that pipe we can change its initial status to closed. And when we do that and simulate uh, the system, I get warning messages, I get negative pressures again. Now I have negative six PSI. We're not allowing flow to go through that pipe. It all has to come through this long uh, branch down to that point. Um, and so now I would say, well, this has to be even bigger or there's other options too, right? I can add pipes in parallel. I can do other things to try to solve that problem. And again, in reality, I would want to make sure that throughout my system, even if a pipe was out of service, no matter where a fire came, uh, I could still maintain pressure to fight it. Okay, uh, just a few other things I have not mentioned yet that are really useful. Um, you'll notice that the flow arrows are telling me which direction in the pipes the flow is going. That's what the flow arrows do. There's also signs on the flow. So here you can see this one is a positive 237.42. This is a negative 232.92. Regardless of what uh, those signs are, again, I will just repeat it. The flow arrows tell you which direction the flow is going in the pipe. And the value of this tells me what the magnitude of the flow is. All the sign is doing is telling you what is the direction of flow relative to what the start node is and what the end node is. In this case, this is junction 16, this is junction 17. So in this pipe, because the flow is going from 16 to 17, from the start node to the end node, it gets a positive flow number. 
In this case, I look at this pipe, its start node is 14 and its end node is 17. This is junction 14, so the direction of this pipe is from left to right, but the flow from the flow arrow is from right to left, and so this flow gets a, sign, a negative sign. It does not mean that the flow is going from left to right because the arrow is to the left, but it's negative. The, the negative doesn't cancel out the arrow. The arrow is always pointing in the direction of the flow. The negative just means it's going against the direction the pipe was drawn when I drew it in Ethernet, the start to end node. Um, so in addition to being able to view um, results through the browser, I can also view them in reports. So I can look at tables of, let's say, all the nodes. If I look at that, it's going to show me all the nodes, their demands. Here's my Fireflow demand. Here's all the rest of them. It'll show me the head, the pressure, the quality, and I can actually right click on these and change what I want it to show. If I wanted to then put that in an Excel sheet, like copy this into something else, it's a little hard to find, but basically I click up here in the upper left to highlight everything, and then I go up to edit, copy to, and then I can copy it to the clipboard and paste it into Excel, and it'll paste all the row and column headers with it. Um, so that's how I do that. I can also show outputs of graphs. Now, graphs mostly don't help that much, uh, at least the time series graphs, when I'm doing a simulation like this. You'll notice, like, this simulation is just giving me one set of flows and um, demands, because I just set it up for one scenario. There's no time dependency in this simulation. If I did add time dependency to this so that like the demands were changing hour by hour, the level in the tank would be changing and the nodes would have a pressure at each hour. The flows would have a, a flow at each hour. And then I could plot time series of different parameters and look at those graphs. For us right now, it doesn't really help us that much. Um, beyond that, uh, that's, I think, mostly it. Um, a couple of things I can pan around with the pan button. This, this version of Ethernet does allow for mouse scroll wheeling. Older versions didn't in the past. Um, so that's nice. Um, <clears throat> other than that, just trying to see if I forgot anything. If I wanted to add a backdrop, um, like an image behind this that I could use to trace or whatever, I could do that through the backdrop through the load option. Um, let's see, toolbar. Oh, I guess in the options, um, I did show you the flow arrows. Um, I did show you the notation. I can change the size of that if I want, so I can make the labels bigger. Um, I can change how big the links uh, plot and how big the nodes plot. There is this proportional to value option you can mess with. I don't really like that that much, but it's something you can play with if you want to. Um, I think that is it for what I wanted to show you today. So going back to um, this, the there's two kind of parts to this lab exercise. One is for this network we just developed, I want you to just finish provide, uh, designing a solution to provide at least 20 PSI to every node with that fire to, at the node in the lower right um, and with the worst pipe out of service. What I mean is with any single pipe out of service, it needs to work. You don't need to know what the worst one is, but um, it just means all, no matter which pipe was out of service, it works. And then... Uh, you don't have to simulate that for every node or all of that, but this just kind of tells me tells you what I want to see. And then I want you to build a new system and um, so try one other simulation. Example 15.11 in in the book um, in the book that we're using this um, Gupta hydrology uh, hydrology and hydraulic systems example 15.11. 
Um, assume the Hayes and Williams value is C equals 120. You'll report what the flow rate in each pipe is, the head loss uh, from point A to point E. Don't forget that piece. Solution shown in your book so you can see if you did it right. You'll need to make sure that your units are set to CFS. Um, and then note here that uh, in this example, there's no reservoir shown, um, but Ethernet requires a reservoir in order to run. So you have to plop a reservoir down, set its head to 100, and then we're going to connect it to the system, but then we're going to close the pipe that's connected. All that does then is say, at that node, the head is 100, and then all the other heads in the system are going to be relative to that head. So when you look at head loss, you can again do a differential between those two. And the actual problem description says the pressure head at A is 100 feet, so this makes sense. And that concludes the introduction to Epanet. So good luck.